And uh, finally, the overall theme is for the three three months is Jesus the Messiah. That's right on the front of your quarterly. And I'm going to share something with you a little later. And I don't think I have enough to It's my Bible there. Uh, let me get... He's a mute. <laughs> So, I think we, we're going to be all right time-wise, and uh, like I said, we do want to allow Larry plenty of time to, to teach, because we've got another great lesson today. Let me make one last you, sir. We are trying an experiment today. We are going to record the Sunday School lesson, including the music, and we will probably broadcast it this week, but I'll let you all know through Dorothy uh, where you can pick it up and watch it. Next Sunday, we're going to try to live stream it. Let's start live. Live stream. Live streaming. So, uh, if you are uncomfortable coming to Sunday school, you can stay home and watch the Sunday school lesson. So, uh, wow. So we're we're live now. So it's all yours. Are we live streaming now? <laughs> well, we're recording. We're recording. Okay. Uh, but anyway, and we are. I may curtail the music just a little. Right now, I'm not planning to. We're, we're just singing a cappella, and I think we can handle that all right. Uh, see either that or just let the music go, and I don't, I don't really think it's necessary to do that. Let me mention some names here because we do certainly want to pray for several of our members who really, really need our prayers at this particular time. And with the virus all over the world like it is, I know that's uppermost in everyone's mind. And uh, you're already praying about that. And uh, for first of all, I think for God's wisdom on exactly uh, how to deal with all of this. And truth be known, there are multitudes across the earth who are really, you know, just... They're living in, in, in constant fear of this. And a lot of this is, is, is people without faith. And so, yet, God's in control. Amen? Amen. And we uh, are just trusting Him during this time. And yet, we want to be prudent and wise in all that we do. But let me mention some names, and then you may have others, and I'll pray. And <clears throat> Excuse me. I think this may be in a couple of songs, and then if my voice holds out, I'll... I have in mind, I want to use one of Dottie Rambo's songs. I love I, I loved her music simply from the standpoint of the, of her, of the message in her songs. And she didn't write all of that many, but they're, they're all very, very good. Earl and Judy Giles. Of course, Earl is, you know, you know about him. And uh, I think, George, that Dorothy had heard that, that Earl is not doing real well. Uh, isn't that true that he just, uh, anyway, he's having a tough go. And Judy, of course, you know, is just really, really stressed out over this, this matter. So pray for the Giles, Dan and Millie Ward. Dan had a treatment this week. He said, I'll just be too weak to be there Sunday. But uh, he said, you pinch hit for me Sunday, and I'll, I'll do the same for you the next Sunday. Warren and Mar Marilyn Stone, now he's in the rehab center at, at ORU, I think. And so continue to pray uh, for Warren, remember Marilyn, and uh, uh, I don't think things have changed there to our knowledge that much, but anyway. Pray for one Max Cobb. Max, you know, f fell, I think, and injured his, uh, his, his ankle. Yeah. Okay, and kind of walked, so. And then Maxine has listed some here who are just, uh, as she says, has the sniffles, <laughs> episodes maybe or whatever, and Becky's one of those. Do you want to give an update on her? Is she, she just kind of under the weather a little bit? Yeah, she came down with a cold. Okay, kind of, kind of cold stand since. So Jerry. pray for her. And Dorothy, I think, is fighting allergies. Dorothy Kiefer, is that correct? Go ahead. Right. Let's also keep Jerry and uh, Fred Williams in our prayers. I didn't get that name. Fred and Jerry Williams. 
The Williams, yeah, Jerry Williams and Fred. Yeah, yeah. I haven't seen him in quite a while. You got people like them. Right for the Williams. Ken and Loretta Jones. Ken is, Ken is, I think you know, has been diagnosed with COPD. And uh, uh, it's, he's just, he's just, he, he, he's really fighting a battle. Now, and then, uh, well, let's go the hills, of course. Margaret, Nolan, and anyone else like that you want to mention that we, I mean, we don't, know, we don't want to overlook those folks who don't intend to. Jerry, just all of the homebound Excuse people. Excuse me? All of the homebound people, and we yes. met several. The homebound, and some of those would be like probably the Hills and Joneses, and who else am I living off there? Faye Newman. Faye Newman. Yeah, Faye Newman. But uh, do you, did, did, are there other requests that you have? I have a good friend, Hugh Biggs. They have got chemo and radiation. Got into a therapy. So Hugh Biggs needs our prayers. Did you give me name or did you just say two friends? Hugh Biggs. His name is Hugh Biggs. Hugh Biggs. Hugh, Hugh Biggs. Hugh. Hugh, H-U-G-A. Hugh Biggs. He's a good man just at Owasa. Okay. Pray for her friend Hugh. Let's just pray for you. What else you want to mention? Thank you. I want to mention anyone else? I don't think I'm in battery that have run out. <laughs> Who would be willing to lead us in prayer? I mean, you don't have to call I've every name, but just, just pray with these. Listen, you know, but I don't have they want to do that. Lee, could you do that for us? Just stand on. Let's go get the doctor. Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come together in a small group of fellowship <clears throat> with one another and said your word. Lord, we just know that there are so many folks that has the uncertainty of what's going on in this world. And we know also that you are in total control and uh, we should not worry but rely on you. We ask you to meet each and every one of those who were mentioned today. Lord, we know that you have a plan for their life and we just pray that the plan is something that is pleasing to all the and uh, Final end, we know that your will will be done. We ask that you be with our church as we go through this period of time of under, not understanding the ramifications of this virus that they say is going on. And we just know that if we continue to lean on you and stay with you and not worry and trust you that everything will turn out all right. Be with Larry as he brings us the message about the birth of our Savior. And then as we go to the church, be with the pastor as he brings the message that you have placed on his heart. We ask you, Lord, to continue to bless us, walk with us, take care of us, and we'll give you all the praise and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Lee. <coughs> Yeah, I have. <clears throat> Excuse me. I get these frogs right here, John. <laughs> Give me a second here. <clears throat> I guess it's a frog. Might be a snake. Oh, yeah. Anyway, uh, David has the uh, songs up here we were going to do. I might just do a verse or two of each one of them. Uh, and then hope Dan will be able to sing next Sunday. He enjoys doing this very, very much. I've got the bulletin here, but I don't see anything that I I need to call attention to. I'd be happy to if there if there is anything. But anyway, you get a copy of it, so we won't go over that. I think we need to. We're, we're going to get. We're we're shooting to get Larry in here at least by the. Our mark, and I think that we're going to be in good shape there. Uh, however, I think that clock's a little bit slow, isn't it? Uh, yeah. About an hour and ten minutes. As I said, the theme for the entire quarter is Jesus the Messiah. And in a recent daily devotional of Billy Graham's, 
He has one from Revelation 22 called On the Focal Point. This is a very familiar text where Jesus, where it said, he said Jesus said, I'm the, Alpha and the, the, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the, the first and the last, the beginning of the end. Maybe you've heard this before, but since our entire quarter is on, is on Jesus the Messiah, this was his devotional for February 24th. The central message of the Bible is Jesus Christ. In Genesis, Jesus is the seed of the woman. In Exodus, the Passover lamb. In Leviticus, he's the atoning sacrifice. In Numbers, he's the smitten rock. In Deuteronomy, the prophet. In Joshua, the captain of the Lord's hosts. In Judges, the, the, the deliverer. In Ruth, he's the heavenly kinsman. In the sixth book of the kings, he's the promised king. In Nehemiah, he's the restorer of the nation. In Esther, he's the advocate. In Job, he's my redeemer. In Psalms, he's my strength. In Proverbs, he's my pattern. In Ecclesiastes, he's my goal. In the Song of Solomon, he's my satisfier. In the Prophets, he's the coming Prince of Peace. In the Gospels, he's the Christ who came to seek and to save that which was lost. In Acts, he is Christ risen. In the Epistles, he is Christ exalted. In Revelation, he is Christ returning and reigning. That was from his devotional on February the 24th. Uh, so Jesus in the, is, is certainly the focal point of the Bible from Genesis all the way through Revelation. Or one of the focal points, let's put it that way. And probably a major one. I thought that was worth sharing. Well, I don't guess we have anybody to give us a, a, a pitch pipe. A pitch pipe, sorry, here, so we'll just start. Let's start with 155, 512. We'll just probably do a verse or so. Maybe just one verse of each one of these. Jesus is all the world to me. I, my joy, my all. He is my strength from day to day. Without Him I will fall. When I am sad to Him I go. Another one can cheer me so. When I am sad, he makes me glad. He's my friend. Let's go to the next song. I know of a name, a beautiful name, that angels draw down to earth. They whisper. Earlier, 
this is a short one, and then Larry will come up. But uh, this certainly, like I said two or three weeks ago, uh, with this overall theme that we have for these next three months, any song about our Lord would certainly be appropriate. And that could be said for any time, uh, regardless of when. But I love this short song that Dottie Rambo wrote entitled Behold the Lamb. Let me share this and Larry will be up here. I'll get my music here. Behold the Lamb. Behold the Lamb. Slain from the foundations of the world. Uh, I know that uh, uh, 
David and, and several others, Dave McPherson and others, are working to uh, make it available for you to watch online a Sunday school lesson, uh, whether it's this week's or next week's. I, I don't know how that works, but be smart. Um, I, I know even even Dan, uh, he needs to be smart. You know, anybody that's going through treatments, things of that nature, you don't need to be around a lot of people who might be carrying a, a virus. Uh, and, and it doesn't have to be COVID-19. I mean, any flu, anything like that. Um, so, um, we are looking today at Luke 1 and Luke 2 um, about the birth of the Messiah. Um, I think it's interesting to look at the background of what has been going on in the life of the nation of Israel, God's people, that leads up to the birth of Christ, the birth of the Messiah. Uh, it had been 400 years since God's people had heard a message from God. Now, I just thought, you know, what would it be like in your mind if you had not had a message from God just in your lifetime? When you look at the birth of our country, um, over 200 years old now, but almost twice the length of our nation's existence, there had been no message from God. Uh, no major prophets, no major prophecies. Uh, so it's almost as if God's people had forgotten what the promises of God were. Um, and then within the course of just a few short months, God gives two major messages. Um, one is Zechariah and one to Mary. Now, we could also include in that Joseph. Uh, and who was the messenger? Gabriel. It was Gabriel. Now, we're only told the name of two angels and I could I could maybe say uh, three but specifically only the names of two angels Gabriel and Michael and the angel of the Lord I would throw that one in which most of the time I think scholars would agree means Jesus himself but Gabriel comes to um, a priest and his wife who have been fervently wanting a child but late in life had still not gotten a child. And Gabriel comes and brings that message to that family. And then Gabriel goes to Mary and visits with her. And then at least three times to Joseph. Uh, so the activity of God's messages to his people picks up significantly uh, through Gabriel, who is really um, the major messenger, I would say, of, of God. He's always bringing great news. He's always bringing spectacular news. Um, let's look at Luke 1 and we're going to start with verse 26. And we'll read through verses 33. In the sixth month and, and a lot of translations stop right there. What does it mean in the sixth month? 
uh, her pregnancy. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. All right? In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a village in Galilee, to a virgin named Mary. She was engaged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of King David. Gabriel appeared to her and said, Greetings, favorable woman. The Lord is with you. Confused and disturbed, Mary tried to think what the angel could mean. Don't be afraid, Mary, the angel told her, for you have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be very great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David, and he will reign over Israel forever. His kingdom will never end. I'm interested most of the time when Scripture indicates that an angel of any kind has a message for people, what is usually the first thing the angel would say? Fear not. Fear not. <coughs> Don't be afraid. Is, is that a good word for us today? You bet it is. You bet it is. In a few minutes we're going to talk about the fact that God is sovereign. He's all-knowing. He's all-powerful. And the world is in His hands. So, uh, let's begin with the idea that what Gabriel says to Mary is basically an outline of the life of Christ. Of what His life will be and what the expectations of His people are should be. Um, what does it mean for a virgin to conceive? That's kind of a tough one, isn't it? Um, With, with no human father, Mary produced Jesus Christ. How did that happen? The Holy Spirit um, was over her. Uh, and so this was a divine act and it was important for us to understand that even though Joseph was the earthly father, he was not the human father. Now, descendant of David. You know, there there is there is a I guess you could call it a theory that the reason that Joseph could not be uh, the human father is because he is of the lineage of one of the kings named Je Jehoiachin who had a curse put upon him because he was an evil king. And God basically said, none of your offspring, first of all, you won't have offspring, and second of all, if you did, they wouldn't sit on the throne. Well, that was a temporary curse, apparently, because he did have children, and he did have a son later on that sat on the throne. So there are theorists who say that even though Jehoiakim's name is in the lineage of Joseph, it's listed in, I believe it's in Matthew, um, that because of Jehoiakim, 
that Joseph could not be the earthly father. Well, that's just a theory, okay? Uh, the reason that Joseph couldn't be the earthly father is because then Jesus would not have been divine. He would have been all human. Yeah. So, what we need to understand is that this Jesus guy is all God, but he's all human. So how does that work? You know, I think we overlooked the fact that Mary was also of the line of David. She had to be. <laughs> so that made it a fact that he came from the line of David. And it's more important that the human instrument of the birth be of the lineage of David. So that Christ could sit on David's throne, which will happen. He's on it now, but it will be established on earth later. Okay. So, have you ever wondered, now it's okay for us to think outside the lines, have you ever wondered why Jesus didn't inherit what's called sin nature? You and I inherit it, don't we? When we're born, Why did Jesus not? He would have a hard time being a sacrifice, perfect sacrifice for sin if he already had sin. Larry? Yes, George? How do you define sin nature as genetic <laughs> or what? Aha! <laughs> uh Aha! -huh. Uh -huh. So when you start talking about sin nature, does that mean you automatically are born a sinner? Or does it mean that you're born with a disposition towards sin? What we have to understand is that Jesus was tempted. Was he not? Multiple times. But he never gave in to sin. So this is deep water, okay? What we're talking about right now is, is really deep water. You have to do a lot of thinking about it. Um, so, where does this lead you? Um, some people, it leads them to believe that Mary had to be perfect for Jesus to be divine. And you just stop and think about it for a minute. If, if you want to let your mind try to be rational, you can make an argument for that. Because anybody past Adam and Eve is born with the tendency, what some people call sin nature. Alright? So, Joseph would have been sinful. Mary would have been sinful. Um, and so there are those people who say that if Mary was the human instrument of the birth of Christ, that one or two things had to happen. Either Jesus wasn't perfect or that Mary was and that she could be a perfect vessel that would give birth to Christ. So uh, that gives birth to what some people, some theologians call the Immaculate Conception. And so what is the Immaculate Conception? It really has more to do with Mary's mother than it does with Mary. Did you know that? It has to do with the fact that God granted Mary's mother to be sinless so that Mary could then be sinless. Now, if you believe that, you have to believe that from the time that she was born till the time that she conceived, she didn't ever sin. That's probably not very possible. Okay. Um, but yes, George. 
Well, the question that comes to my mind, was Jesus sinless because of his prior perfection and divinity, or was he sinless because of his absolute uh, obedience? <laughs> the answer to that is yes. <laughs> He, he was <laughs> sinless from the beginning and he was sinless in his human life. Had to be to be that perfect sacrifice. We didn't become all knowing. He's always been all knowing. Even in an infant. Since before time. Even in no, an no, now. What we have to understand, and, and, and we're going to talk about this term in a minute, he condescended to us, which means he left his throne in heaven and took on a human form and was subject to all of the shortcomings and things that humans are, but yet did not succumb to that. So. Luke 2.52, Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. So he grew. He grew. And that's one of the important things of Joseph. Joseph was the instrument that I believe taught Jesus. Up until 30 years old or whenever it was that Joseph died. Um, and so he was important. He was important because he protected Mary and Jesus. Um, he was important because he took Mary to Bethlehem to be registered so that prophecy could be fulfilled the way Isaiah 7 14 says. Uh, so he was important that he was obedient to what God told him. The angel appeared to Joseph three times. Uh, I know when he was trying to decide whether to put Mary away or not, Gabriel appeared to him. Um, and then when it was time for them to flee to Egypt, he appeared. the angel appeared again in a dream. And then when the king died and it was time for them to go back, he appeared again. So, Joseph's obedience through all this is a very important role. Now, I want to I want to chase this deal with Mary just a little bit further. Um, and let me get to my notes on this because I don't want to stray away. The fact that Jesus was born of a virgin uh, is important. Um, I I have a friend uh, who I grew up with, same church. Uh, we went to different universities, but we ended up in seminary together. In fact, the very first night that Brenda and I were in Louisville, Kentucky, we spent the night in this person's home. And he was also a student at the seminary. And he wanted to be ordained by our home church. And so after some time in seminary, he went back to Oklahoma City and was, um, he went through an ordination council. And in that ordination council, he was questioned and it was discovered that he did not believe in the virgin birth. And because of that, he was not ordained by that church. If I mentioned his name, Papa, you would know who I'm talking about. You would at least know the last name. Um, so what you believe about the virgin birth is important, okay? Now, just to show you kind of a slippery slope of, of what that involves, um, our, our Roman Catholic friends, and, and I want you to understand, I'm not putting them down. I'm just trying to um, 
to explain what we believe scripturally uh, about all of this. If you believe that she was perfect, you can make the case that she also played a role in redemption. And so our, our Roman Catholic friends believe that Mary is what's called the co-redemptress. That she also plays a role in redeeming mankind. Um, the problem with that is we don't have anything scripturally that leads us to believe in it. They also <coughs> pray through Mary. Um, in fact, the rosary addresses the Blessed Mary. Um, I don't know why this is important, but in their faith, they believe that Mary was perpetually a virgin. That even after she conceived Christ and He was born, that she was a virgin from then on. What's wrong with that? The brothers. Oh, James. And sisters. <clears throat> we know of at least four brothers by name. And we know at least two sisters. The reason we don't know names there. But we know there were at least two because when it's referred to in Scripture, it's in plural. Daughters. Or, excuse me, sisters. And so, you remember the story of Jesus being in a home and was teaching and somebody ran to him and said, Master, your, your mother and your brothers are waiting outside that want to talk to you. And he said, Who are my mother? Who is my mother and my brothers? Only those who do the will of God. Which is interesting. Where does that put Mary at that point? It's so one thing to say that the brothers didn't believe in the role of Jesus, but at this point, Mary was with them. I've always wondered about that. Did she have doubts, you know, about the role of Christ? I, I don't think so. But that passage kind of leaves the door open for some, some wondering about that. So, um, if you believe Scripture, you believe that Mary had other children and that she was not perpetually a virgin. They also believe that because she was holy, they believe in what is called the bodily assumption of Mary. That means that at the end of her life, she was assumed into heaven. She didn't actually die. She was taken to heaven, uh, spirit and body intact, to heaven. We don't have any indication of any of that. In fact, you know, that is a very modern thought. Um, Pope Pius XII on November the 1st of 1950, 1950, made a papal decree that that is what Catholics believe. Based on tradition, not on spiritual fact. Uh, so, uh, a lot of these things are... Um, are modern. Uh, have you ever heard of the term uh, ex cathedra? The papal statement ex cathedra. That means he made the statement in the chair of Peter. You, be, you know that they believe that the Pope is in direct succession to the apostles. And so Peter being the, the foundation of the church, they believe that he is the one that they are all from, and so they use that chair as a symbol of authority 
And Pope Pius made that decree ex cathedra, in, in the chair of Peter. Uh, so some of these things are, um, are important. And so it's important for us to understand that the Immaculate Conception and the Virgin Birth are not the same thing. Uh, the Immaculate Conception is, is that Mary had to be perfect. The Virgin Birth just means that Mary was a virgin. So how do you justify all that stuff? How do you justify human nature and Mary having to be perfect and all that stuff? The way I simply look at it is the Holy Spirit can do whatever the Holy Spirit wants to do. And it was it was the promise of God that He would do this. And so in this passage of Scripture that we just read, we get several statements. Um, we get the statement that uh, He will be a Savior. Um, now, we can, we can split hairs here. Mary in the Magnificat talks about her Savior. If she was sinless, why did she need to save her? So in her own words, in the Magnificat, which we'll look at in just a minute, um, she says, my Savior. So, um, what does the word Jesus mean? It's actually a it connects to the word Joshua. Uh, the Old Testament term would be Yeshua. And it just simply means that Jehovah saves. So there's a role of Jesus being the Savior that Gabriel talks about. You remember uh, in Luke, when the angel appears to the shepherds, what did he say? A Savior will be born to you in the city of David. A Savior who is Christ the Lord. Gabriel talks about the fact that He will be great. Uh, in Greek, that word great would probably be more extraordinary or magnificent. So Jesus will be great even though He was humble. In a sermon, Scripture indicates that he was to be great. And then here's the one that I like. The Son of the Most High. What does that mean? Who's the Most High? God. He is the Most High. Um, that is a title of God. And, and so Christ the Messiah is equated with the Most High, with God. He is all God, but all human. The term, the Hebrew term for the Most High is El Elyon. El Elyon means God Most High. So for God to be most high, it means that He is sovereign. What does it mean to be sovereign? Okay. He's totally in control, doesn't it? It means that He reigns. That's where the word sovereign comes from. That He reigns. It, it's His show. He's all-powerful, all-known. And so He reigns. And we talk in Scripture, we talk about the fact that He reigns where? On high. He reigns on high. So, this means that Jesus is literally um, the essence, the same essence as God. Um, it also talks about the fact that He will be a king, that He will, king, that he will have a, a reign as David's successor on the throne of David, which is the Old Testament prophecy. 
uh, that is fulfilled. When will Christ be on the throne? He is right now, I think. He's on the throne right now. When will be when will he be on the earthly throne? You ever heard of the thousand year reign of Christ? And whether that's literal or figurative, I'll leave that up to you. But he will establish here on earth uh, his reign on the throne of David, which will fulfill scripture. All right, let's read quickly Luke 2. Let's just start at the very first verse. At that time, the Roman Emperor Augustus decreed that a census should be taken throughout the Roman Empire. Do you know that historians tell us that they don't record that census? History doesn't speak to a worldwide census like that, a Roman-wide census. Um, I know in my heart of hearts that somewhere along the line there will be some discovery. <laughs> uh, and so there are those who think that this was more regional taxation than it was a worldwide taxation. Okay? This was the first census taken when Quirinius was governor of Syria. Guess what? History doesn't tell us that Quirinius was the governor of Syria. He may have been a regional figurehead of Syria, but he was not the king of Syria. All returned to their own ancestral towns to register for the census. And because Joseph was a descendant of King David, he had to go to Bethlehem in Judea, David's ancient home. He traveled there from the village of Nazareth in Galilee. He took with him Mary, to whom he was engaged, who was now expecting a child. Let's parenthetically look at this. How long was Mary with Elizabeth? We think around three months because scripture indicates that she left to go back home which is the very last verse of chapter one but it doesn't say that she was there for the birth of John the Baptist so when scripture says she went back home where is home you ever thought about that did she go back to live with mom and dad or did she go back to live with Joseph? I'll let you figure that one out. What we know is that there's a three month period there because when you look back, you see that in the sixth month she was there with Elizabeth. That's the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy. Okay? Verse 6, and while they were there, the time came for her baby to be born. She gave birth to her firstborn son, wrapped him snugly in strips of cloth, and laid him in a manger because there was no lodging available for them. Now, that's really where our reading ends. And so the, the point of that in our lesson is that Jesus went from a throne to a manger. He condescended to us. We, we talked about that a minute ago, the fact that even though He was in essence all God, He took on a fleshly existence to be all human. Now, I can't explain that. Can you? How a person can be all God and all man? Humanly, we can't explain 
explain that. But that is something that we have to believe by faith that God can do what God can do. And God did that to fulfill His promises to us that He would provide a Savior, Christ the Lord. Any questions? You're smarter than I am then. <laughs> We've been through some, some the, old, the old farmers used to say some tall cotton. We've been, we've been through some deep water and some tall cotton um, talking about those theological issues and we can't expect in 30 minutes or 40 minutes to be able to completely explain all that needs to be explained or if we had a whole semester of seminary, we still couldn't explain it all other than God is sovereign, God can do what God chooses to do and He chooses to initiate relationship with His people. God chooses to have a relationship with you and with me. And so, I hope that not only is Christ the Messiah of the New Testament, but that Christ is Messiah and Lord of all to you. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the depths of truth from your word. Thank you that you chose to send your son to be that perfect sacrifice for us and to initiate conversation and relationship with us. Thank you that by his stripes we are healed. And by His blood, we receive propitiation, covering, that Your sacrifice covers our sin. Thank You for such great truths, Father. May we be open-minded and have open hearts to receive Your truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a good week. <coughs>